Okay, in this lecture we're going to discuss uh, some of the definitions and uh, consequences of issues such as prejudice and discrimination. Um, again, these are words which are sometimes used interchangeably, uh, again, meaning the same thing or that there's not much of a distinction between them. However, we're going to take a look at the fact that there is a pretty uh, significant distinction between these two terms. Um, prejudice can be generally defined as an attitude and generally negative attitude uh, about uh, a racial or ethnic group. Again, groups that are perceived on racial terms, but more specifically and more correctly, ethnic groups. Um, so again, when people have negative uh, beliefs or ideas or attitudes about another group, uh, that can be considered prejudice. A um, couple of important points here. Uh, Clearly, like most things we talk about associated with uh, culture and society, uh, prejudice is learned. It is not inherited. Uh, so again, there's no such thing as naturally occurring uh, prejudice. Uh, these are, uh, again, ideas and attitudes um, that are learned by individuals. Uh, when we look at the patterns of prejudice, we clearly see that uh, individuals who express uh, a great deal of prejudice or prejudice about uh, groups tend not to only be prejudiced or have prejudiced attitudes against any one specific group, but uh, generally tend to have uh, prejudiced attitudes about um, most groups that are considered to be uh, uh, undesirable within a society. So it's pretty unlikely that a person would have a negative attitude about specifically one group and not share that those attitudes about uh, any group within the society which might be considered a minority group or considered undesirable within the society. Um, and another, uh, a lot of people tend to think of uh, prejudice as only existing from dominant groups toward minority groups. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. Um, again, uh, prejudice attitudes can be shared by anybody within a society against any other group. Uh, so it could be prejudices that a minority group has against a dominant group or against other minority groups or in the case of a phenomenon we sometimes call uh, the internalization of dominant norms. Uh, again, if we break that word down, internalization means taking in dominant, meaning from the dominant groups, and norms, rules uh, that support values in a society. When we put that terminology together, we can sometimes see that even within uh, minority groups, uh, those individuals within those minority groups can sometimes have very prejudiced attitudes even about the other members within their groups uh, based on, and this is sometimes called collective hatred or, or self-loathing, uh, that minority groups and individuals within them might actually adopt some of the prejudices of the dominant groups uh, against other people within their own groups. Um, so again, prejudice is a pretty uh, comprehensive uh, issue and something that uh, uh, you know, transcends a lot of boundaries. Uh, different than prejudice is discrimination. So as we talk about prejudice being an attitude, discrimination is an action or a behavior of unfair treatment against another group within a society. Uh, now typically we talk about, we introduce the idea of this is generally uh, dominant groups discriminating against minority groups because, again, the dominant groups are in the position of uh, superior social status, uh, increased power, and the ability to exercise that power to uh, discriminate against or take action against other groups within the society that they find undesirable. So as prejudice could be shared by just about anybody in society against anybody else, discrimination does generally kind of flow in one direction from dominant groups, uh, group or groups toward minority group or groups. Um, and within that, then we definitely talk about specifically when we talk about racism within a society. Again, this is a pattern of discriminatory action or behavior against people of, once again, what is culturally defined as a specific race. So when we talk about now when societies do uh, distinguish people as belonging to different racial groups, even though we talked about the fact that, uh, you know, um, that's very difficult to do accurately, but certainly we know within societies uh, this uh, uh, social construction uh, 
of the idea of race does exist, when we see patterns of discrimination based on those lines, that's how we define racism. Um, so again, up till now we've talked about prejudice and discrimination largely as being uh, the attitudes and behaviors of individuals. So certainly individuals can have prejudice attitudes or engage in discriminatory behavior. And again, we would think about that kind of on a micro level or occurring amongst the individuals in society. But when we see discrimination occurring uh, on a large scale within a society or especially these patterns of behavior that are actually part of the social structure, then we get into a discussion of what we call institutional discrimination. So again, this isn't uh, the uh, necessarily the behavior of just individuals, but we're seeing that discrimination or uh, actions against minority groups have become part of the social structure and uh, therefore kind of transcend uh, the behavior of individuals within the society. So I often would give uh, students not only in this class, but if you have the opportunity to take Sociology 205, uh, Race and Ethnic uh, Studies, uh, you will discuss this in more detail. Uh, if you walk into uh, a store and the proprietor of the store refuses your service, refuses you service based on his or her perceived uh, attitudes or the, uh, perceived uh, your race or ethnic group, um, that is discrimination by an individual. Uh, but clearly, studies have been done about institutional discrimination, and when we look at things like, let's say, uh, the mortgage lending industry, uh, when uh, uh, statistics are compiled that demonstrate that African Americans and Latinos are 60% more likely to be uh, denied mortgages or other types of loans, uh, even with comparable credit ratings as whites, then we're talking about institutional discrimination. That's not the behavior of one loan officer or, or one uh, bank uh, that has a certain policy. Uh, that's nationwide and, and, affects, and, and uh, affects an entire industry. So clearly what we're looking at is not necessarily just the behavior of individuals, although the behaviors involve individuals. Uh, we're looking at uh, discrimination which is uh, societal and, and part of the social structure. Um, another part, another example of that is uh, in, in the healthcare industry. Uh, again, studies uh, shown say that whites tend to receive more uh, extensive medical attention, and uh, in when we look at uh, the outcomes of some of that, um, the uh, mortality rate among mothers and uh, children during childbirth are much higher among minority groups. Uh, so again, is that because of the actions of one or a few uh, irresponsible doctors? Uh, no, that's institutional. Okay? That, that's uh, affecting large amounts of people based on, like I said, discrimination practice in the social structure. Okay, so regarding these issues of race and ethnicity, uh, we can kind of break them down uh, by looking at them from each of the, the major sociological perspectives. Um, so just to kind of run those down again, functionalism, uh, we want to take a look at uh, racial and ethnic issues from a functional point of view. Again, functionalists think about society as a living organism, all the parts working together uh, and defining things and breaking them down by their function and structure. Um, we could definitely say that, and most functionalists would say that, uh, certainly ethnic identity can be functional in the sense that it forms people into uh, kind of us versus them groups in which solidarity is formed. So again, very functional way of looking at uh, differences among uh, races and ethnicities. So if people are, let's say, uh, we look at uh, American immigration and we look at um, you know, various groups coming into this country and then uh, associating with other people of similar cultural, uh, ancestral uh, background, uh, and then forming uh, groups that help each other succeed. So if you go to you know, any large city and you, you know, see a Chinatown there, or a little Italy, and you wonder how those neighborhoods came about, uh, clearly from a functional point of view, immigrants coming to a country are gonna seek out other people of very similar uh, cultural heritage and those people that form units that assist each other. So it's a very functional way of looking at race and uh, uh, ethnicity. Uh, 
Um, however, we can say that things like prejudice and discrimination then can actually serve to destroy or break down the relationships in a society. So when we see things like racial tension, racial strife, um, you know, in its most extreme form, things like race riots or, like we said, some of these institutional discriminations which harm the relationships in society, then that would be considered dysfunctional. So again, functionalists would look at uh, racial and ethnic identity as being both functional and dysfunctional uh, based on the behaviors. From a conflict theory point of view, again, the idea that groups within a society compete, uh, clearly racial and ethnic groups uh, and uh, the distinctions between them um, would focus on uh, the, uh, where power is being uh, exerted to give some groups advantage over others. So clearly if we're talking about the difference between uh, uh, dominant groups and minority groups, conflict theorists would clearly say that uh, the dominant group or the position of the group in power is going to exert power over uh, minority groups in order to keep them uh, in their place in society. Um, even if we just think about uh, upper, middle, lower classes or in a pure Marxian way, uh, bourgeoisie versus proletariat, uh, we can look at uh, the role that uh, racial uh, and ethnic identity play uh, in the sense that the group in power, the dominant group, will actually exploit racial and ethnic differences among the working class uh, to create what's called a split labor market. In other words, uh, the, uh, the dominant group or the capitalists would exploit uh, prejudices among various ethnic groups to keep the working class divided and fighting among themselves, therefore maintaining their status as the elites uh, within a society. So again, some conflict theory points of view there. And clearly, if we're going to come at issues about uh, race and ethnicity from a symbolic interactionist point of view, um, we're going to talk about how these issues affect the interactions between individuals. Um, one of the things we clearly study is some of the uh, labels uh, that a society will put on each other uh, based on uh, uh, race and ethnicity. Uh, we can study things like ethnic slurs, which are, of course, very uh, powerful, short-handed ways of co uh, conveying a lot of powerful emotion uh, regarding uh, other ethnic groups. Um, we can talk about how stereotypes affect our interactions with each other, uh, again, our attitudes, uh, but the way they play out in our interactions that sometimes even stereotypes can be sometimes what we call self-fulfilling. Uh, when we uh, have a specific attitude and then practice discrimination against another group, and then uh, that stereotype can then be reinforced by the fact that minority groups find it very difficult to succeed in society. Um, so again, those are different ways of looking at these issues from each of the main perspectives. Um, the very last thing we can talk about in this section are some of the attitudes, or again, we're looking at things from a macro standpoint, the attitudes uh, possible and the behaviors possible uh, on a societal level toward minority groups within a society. Uh, so I've kind of written them out here. I haven't really labeled this continuum. We'll talk about each of these, and then we'll kind of come to our own conclusions about maybe what the title of this uh, continuum could be. But we can talk about certainly one uh, reaction of a society toward minority groups uh, would be genocide. Uh, again, the systematic uh, destruction or extermination uh, of these groups. Uh, clearly, we look around the world and we see uh, whether or not we talk about uh, the Holocaust uh, that occurred in uh, Germany in the 1940s, 1930s and 40s. Uh, we can talk about places around the world where things like ethnic cleansing have gone on. Uh, again, these are systematic uh, attempts to wipe out uh, a minority group by exterminating them. Um, again, these are often uh, accompanied by attempts at dehumanizing, or in some cases justifying the behavior uh, through treating the uh, minority group as less than human. Um, we could also, again, when I say we, I'm talking about as a society, engage in what we call population transfer, uh, the attempt at uh, moving a group uh, 
And this can be done directly or indirectly. Directly would be literally picking the group up and uh, moving them or forcing them to move. Uh, again, we can think about it in American history, uh, attempts against Native Americans to move them onto reservations or get them out of the areas uh, where white settlers uh, uh, intended to uh, populate. Um, so again, we're going to talk about that. Or indirect population transfer, making the conditions within the society so undesirable that the minority group in question will want to leave. Uh, so again, uh, we even saw some of this uh, uh, in various places in Europe uh, against um, uh, Jews, you know, telling, making uh, conditions so undesirable that they would want to leave and immigrate to another place. Uh, we're talking about, to a large degree, Irish immigration, uh, when, again, a lot of people uh, focus on the idea of a potato famine, but that was really kind of the last straw for many, many uh, Irish living in Ireland. Uh, uh, it was much more about uh, the harsh rule of um, the British Empire. Uh, that caused many, many, many people to want to leave uh, Ireland or other places. Um, internal colonialism, uh, another word of putting this is slavery, uh, that the minority group in question within a society is uh, exploited for their economic, the economic gain of the dominant group. Uh, so clearly when we talk about America, uh, there was a group within the society that was exploited for their labor uh, the example I gave uh, in the last lecture about apartheid in South America, uh, another example of internal colonialism, uh, groups that are uh, kept within the society specifically uh, to exploit. And then we could say about segregation. Uh, groups uh, are separated and the dominant group maintains uh, physical and social boundaries uh, from the minority groups. And there are many laws and customs which prevent intermingling. Clearly in American history, we can think about uh, the period of time between the Civil War and the 1960s uh, Civil Rights Movement in which things like Jim Crow laws or uh, segregation were actually enforced. So we talk about this idea of uh, the common uh, expression at the time was separate but equal, although we clearly know that that uh, really lived up to that standard, but the idea of keeping uh, uh, ethnic and uh, racial groups separate. Uh, within the society. Assimilation is another possible reaction of a society to minority groups. Uh, the idea of um, pressuring the minority group to conform to the cultural or uh, ethnic standards of the dominant group. So, in other words, kind of welcome, but now be like us. So, we can think about, uh, again, various uh, ethnic groups uh, as they came to America um, as immigrants, were under a lot of pressure to maintain very low ethnic identity and conform to the standard of kind of what was American, or in other words, the dominant culture. So, uh, you know, again, it's that idea of, you know, welcome, uh, now, you know, take off that funny hat or stop cooking that strange food and uh, put on a baseball hat and eat a hot dog and speak English. Exam all examples of, of assimilation or attitudes of assimilation. And then down here we have uh, the very last definition is multiculturalism uh, or sometimes called pluralism. The idea that within a society not only are minority groups uh, uh, acknowledged but also that they'll be guaranteed the same rights uh, as, and advantages as other people in the society. So uh, full access to all that society's institutions uh, regardless of how much or how little ethnic identity uh, that those groups display. In other words, no discrimination. So when we look at that, all the way from multiculturalism to genocide, uh, really what are we measuring here on this continuum? And the answer, and again, you'll hear this term quite a bit uh, when we talk about uh, relationships between uh, dominant and minority groups, is the idea of tolerance. Um, so when a group or when a society is displaying the most tolerance uh, toward minority groups, uh, then it is truly being multicultural or pluralistic. Uh, when it is exhibiting uh, 
obviously, if we took a look at the genocide, uh, there is almost no tolerance toward minority groups in the attempts to exterminate or uh, cease them uh, from existing. Then we're clearly talking about zero tolerance.